Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the what is the fifth and final uh, of these sessions, which have been called Healthcare Professional Lifestyle Education Sessions. So this is the fifth and final one tonight. And I'm pleased to say that we've got four excellent speakers tonight, um, all talking about interesting topics relating to sort of physical activity, diet and uh, health. Uh, each of the speakers will speak for um, about 25 minutes and then we'll have time for five minutes or so of questions um, after each of the talks. But clearly, if there's lots of discussion to be had and more questions, you can send them into the chat and we'll make sure that you get a response uh, via email um, in, in due course. So the, the four speakers we have tonight, we have Professor David Stencil, who will kick us off with a talk around the possible um, or potential cardiac risks of excessive physical activity. Uh, Dr. Catherine book will then follow on with a talk relating to exercise and bone health. Uh, Dr. Vari Morris will then carry on with a talk relating to physical activity and, and protection from cancer. And then the last talk will be Dr. Natalie Pearson, who will talk about movement uh, and young people. Um, so because we're on quite a, t a strict time schedule, I will hand over to uh, Professor Stencil um, now and we'll get moving quite quickly. But like I said, if you have any questions that pop up during the during the actual talk, please do use the chat function and then we'll, we'll see if David can answer those after his talk. So would you like to share your screen, David? So just as David finds his slides there, so you can see the obviously the um, the title there. So too much of a good thing. Can excessive exercise really damage the heart? Thank you, James. And so just to be sure you are seeing my screen there, James. Yes, we can see those. Those are in presentation mode. Perfect. Um, so thanks, James uh, and Alison, for your uh, introductions and both of you actually for organising the event this evening. Um, so over the next 20 or so minutes, we're going to explore this topic of, of, of whether um, too much exercise or excessive exercise can damage the heart. Um, having finished preparing this talk, um, I did hesitate before continuing to give it because I don't really want to put everybody off from exercising. So I should say, although um, uh, some of the information in here might be a bit concerning. Overall, I'd, I'd like to clarify that the, the benefits of exercise far outweigh the risks, but in certain situations, um, exercise can um, be a risk to the heart, and that's what we're going to look at the evidence a bit now. So I've um, uh, sectioned my, my talk into, into four broad areas. We'll start by having a look at some of the anecdotal evidence um, that exercise might trigger or induce a heart attack or a cardiac arrest or a myocardial infarction. Those are all terms that are used um, uh, for the same uh, thing. And then having had a look at some of that anecdotal evidence, um, the second part of the talk, we'll look at um, what some of the studies say. And these are, we, we don't have randomized controlled trials in this area for obvious reasons. But we'll look at what, what do some of the observational studies say uh, about the risk of exercise induced heart attack. And then um, I'm going to take a little look at um, something that, that's been in the news in more recent years and the potential that, that um, exercise, particularly in middle aged uh, and, and older individuals, might increase the risk of um, probably the most common heart rhythm disorder, um, atrial fibrillation. And, and then for the fourth part of the talk, um, take a, a, a little look at some of the uh, proposed mechanisms which might link exercise with, with heart damage. Um, so if we start by some of the anecdotal evidence, there, there have been several um, high profile uh, cases of exercise uh, induced heart attack, um, which have made it into the um, media or in the press and possibly the most notable of those certainly in, in recent uh, um, times was the very public um, cardiac arrest suffered by um, the, the Danish player Christian Eriksen uh, during the summer this year in the um, Euro 2020 
when that, when that was on our screens and um, it was subsequently confirmed that he'd suffered a cardiac arrest and uh, since been confirmed, at least in the, in the news, that he's had a, um, an ICD, an implantable cardiac device uh, inserted um, to ensure that, that um, or, or to try and ensure that that doesn't happen again. And um, but to my knowledge, that's ended his career in, in uh, playing professional football in Italy, although I think he's still trying to um, uh, re resurrect his career uh, uh, somewhere. Um, probably next to that, probably the, the other most notable case was Fabrice Mwamba collapsing back in 2012 in a match between Tottenham Hotspur and Bolton, um, uh, where he actually according to the news or according um, to, to one of the doctors who treated him was technically dead for 78 minutes. Um, and that brought an end to Fabrice um, Moamba's uh, professional football career, although it did have a happy ending in that he, he, he was revived and is alive and well. Um, and there have been many other um, cases in, in, in football over the years, but it's not just football. Um, this was... Um, uh, Norway's one of Norway's best hopes for an Olympic gold medal prior to the London 2012 Olympics uh, collapsing, I think, in the shower after a workout um, and dying uh, uh, in, in May 2012. Um, this had a happier ending. This was James Taylor, the English cricketer who, who was diagnosed with arrhythmogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy and retired from, from cricket. Um, uh, but, but due to heart disorder um, and um, in, in uh, cycling, this was a, a crash and a death in, in a Belgian cyclist put down to cardiac arrest. Um, there have been um, multiple high-profile um, high um, fatalities in triathlon, um, particularly, not exclusively, but particularly in the swimming stage, the first event of the triathlon. Um, and there's some speculation about that in, in Scientific American there. And, and actually, there now have been one or two um, research papers confirming that the, particularly the swimming phase of triathlon um, seems to increase the risk of, of, of death, mainly due to cardiac arrest. Um, obviously, running, it, 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 um, there have been some high-profile cases in that. I'll mention uh, one a bit later in, in the talk. Don't usually get two deaths in a marathon, but that, that happened in the cardiac, um, uh, sorry, in the Cardiff uh, marathon in 2018. Um, and I could go on. Um, so, you know, if we just look here, Mark Vivian, foe of Cameroon, um, Japanese player, Italian player, Belgian players, um, Cameroon. Uh, this is a player suffering brain damage after cardiac arrest, and and uh, he's continues to be incapacitated. And as I say, the, the list goes on. This is one um, uh, not high profile footballer, but I highlight this one because he's a student at Loughborough University, um, collapsing a few years ago. Um, and the, these are some triathlon ones, and all of these three that I'm showing died in the swimming phase of the event. And if I bring it right up to date, this was just two weeks ago, uh, Sergio, uh, Sergio Aguero, um, whose uh, current uh, playing future is in doubt because he's got cardiac, has cardiac problems. Um, so certainly if, if we are to look, you know, in, in the press, um, it does seem, you know, quite a high risk when, when you look at those um, cases. And I haven't highlighted all the ones I could highlight. What, what does the evidence actually say? Um, well, there, there have been uh, several major sort of observational studies um, over the years conducted in this area. Um, I can, can start with this one published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in uh, 1993, which, which uh, looked at the risk of, of the triggering of an acute myocardial infarction uh, or a heart attack by a heavy exertion. Um, and, and actually, th this uh, paper con concluded that there was um, protection against the trigger triggering in people who regularly um, did um, uh, heavy, heavy exercise. But let's look at a, a bit more closely at what this study found then. So, so there were uh, 1,228 men and women in, in, involved in this study, 
ranging in age from 22 to 92 years. Um, and these people were interviewed between August uh, 1989 and October 1992. And, and these interviews were conducted um, an average of four days after. So quite soon after these individuals suffered myocardial infarctions. And in this study, they cl classed heavy exertion or classified it as exercise uh, uh, above equal to or above six mets. So, so this is six multiples of the resting met metabolic rate. Um, uh, and not everyone actually would consider that as heavy exertion. But for, I, I guess for the average person in the street, that might be heavy um, for, for reference, you know, elite um, people in elite sport would probably regularly exert themselves 20 times or more than the resting metabolic rate. And so what you're seeing here is um, the relative risk on the y-axis of the onset of a myocardial infarction. And that's plotted on a, a logarithmic scale. So we see that it goes up to, to 200 there. So 200 would mean 200 fold higher than resting and resting is the, is this um, the dotted horizontal line going across from a relative risk of one so we're looking at the relative risk of one being in the resting conditions and then the bars here are plotted against the frequency of heavy physical exertion per week so what this shows us is that the, the black bar on the left hand side with a zero underneath it is those who report that they never frequently do any heavy physical exertion. And, and in those people who are, are habitually inactive in, in terms of heavy exertion, when they're exercising, their risk of having a heart attack is a hundredfold increased. That comes down to around 20 fold in people who do one to two bouts of heavy phys physical exertion per week. And then less than 10 in those who do three to four bouts and, and around two to three times higher in those that do five or more bouts of heavy physical exertion per week. So the conclusion of this study is that heavy exertion increases your risk of, of having a heart attack, but that increase is much higher in people that regularly don't do any heavy physical exercise compared with people who do re regularly exert themselves. And that finding was reinforced um, in the Physicians Health Study um, published in 2000 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which involved 12 years of follow up um, and 122 sudden deaths amongst over 21,000 male physicians. And the, the headline conclusion here was that the relative risk of sudden death during and up to 30 minutes after vig vigorous exercise was nearly 17 times higher than when resting. So a 17 fold increase in risk, but the absolute risk rather than the relative, the absolute risk of sudden death during vigorous exercise was extremely low. One sudden death per 1.5 million episodes of exercise. And again, when they categorized people in this little table here, frequency of habitual vigorous exercise, those who did less than one about a week of heavy exercise, um, had a 70-fold, 70 74-fold higher risk during vigorous exercise of, of sudden death. Those who did five or more bouts per week of vigorous exercise habitually, their risk was, was higher, but only 10 to 11-fold higher rather than 74-fold higher. So reinforcing the previous finding. Um, Kim and colleagues in 2012 published a paper where they specifically looked at cardiac arrest during long distance races. Um, so this assessed the incidence and outcomes of cardiac arrest associated with marathon and half marathon races in the United States from January the 1st, 2000 to May the 31st, 2010. And this study, as you can see, in, involved 10.9 million runners um, and with all those runners, 59, uh, only 59 had a cardiac arrest. Most, most of those were men. Mean age was in their early 40s. And when we look at the absolute incidence rate, then it's, it's 0.5 per 100,000 participants. So again, very lower absolute rate. 
The incidence rate was higher during marathons than it was during half marathons and higher in men and has increased in men in, in the last decade. They concluded that last decade being 2000 to 2010. Um, so, so absolute risk, again, very low. And, and they looked at the causes here. And um, I, I don't want to go through all of these, but really highlight the, um, the values in red there in, in the non-survivors that um, about half in about half of the cases, when, when you add these these four red numbers up, the case could be related to what a condition termed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's a plus there to indicate possibly other conditions also, or other factors also. Um, but but those four different, those four rows together combined come to about 50% there. Um, and I'll come back to this um, condition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in a short while. Um, and so the, these, but these, uh, uh, or this incidence continues to hit the headlines. And this is a study or a headline in the BBC News that training very hard was as bad as no exercise at all. And the outcome here wasn't a cardiac arrest, but it was all cause uh, or long term mortality. And this this um, headline on, on the BBC News came from the Copenhagen City Heart Study. Um, don't have time to look at these findings in detail, but um, th this this is these are the findings that triggered that headline. So in this study, they classified people into one of four categories. So they had sedentary non-joggers as their reference group. And then they had light joggers and then moderate joggers and then strenuous joggers. And what you can see is the light joggers and the moderate joggers had a lower risk of mortality than the sedentary group. Um, but, but the strenuous joggers actually had a similar risk to the sedentary group. And that those are when the findings were adjusted for age and sex. And, and if we adjusted or when they adjusted for other factors, actually um, the strenuous joggers had a higher risk um, than even the sedentary people. And, and that's so it's these findings that triggered that headline that, 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 that um, strenuous exercise was was as bad or perhaps even worse than, than doing no exercise at all. Actually, when, when you look at the numbers involved in the strenuous jogger group, it was just two individuals. And so subsequently, people pointed out that this is a, a, a really erroneous conclusion based on only two people. It's highly likely that this could be a statistical artifact and the BBC News subsequently changed their mind a couple of months later why strenuous runs may not be so bad for you after all. So we do have to be careful when these headlines come out. Um, a little more, more recently there's been some focus on atrial fibrillation as I say it's the most common heart rhythm disorder, um, not, not nearly as fatal as cardiac arrest, um, but nevertheless atrial fibrillation does increase the risk of having a stroke fivefold over people who don't have atrial fibrillation. So it is, it is a concern. Um, and so the, the, the issue with, with atrial fibrillation um, is that uh, unlike this normal, nice rhythmic heart, heartbeat um, when you're in sinus rhythm, with atrial fibrillation, the, uh, the atria are, as the term suggests, fibrillating or just contracting very erratically and that compromises the heart's ability to pump um, reduces the cardiac output so it compromises exercise capacity certainly you can't perform um, sport at a high level um, if, if you've got atrial fibrillation but the main problem is that that clot because the atria are not emptying properly clots form in the atria and subsequently, when those clots do get ejected from the heart, they make their way or they can make their way to the brain and, and cause a stroke. Um, and um, anecdotal evidence in recent years has suggested that, that particularly strenuous and, and, uh, um, vigor or high volumes of exercise um, can cause atrial fibrillation. Um, so, so this is one such report in the Sunday Times back in 2017, featuring an ultra distance run and very fit chap, Steve uh, Birkinshaw, um, uh, who um, the suggestion is that, that by forcing his body to do extreme amounts of exercise over many years, that he, he'd um, 
uh, well, as, as this article suggests, his health has, has um, uh, suffered a downhill slide. And when you read through the article, it says that he suffers from chronic fatigue, a fast and irregular heartbeat and high blood pressure. I mean, that, that's anecdotal in um, and, and one case. Um, we've also seen this in the news. And this is, uh, again, an article in the BBC uh, News. Endurance exercise interferes with heart rhythm. And speculation here that F athletes beware endurance training may make it more likely that you will need a pacemaker um, scientists believe. I don't know that there's any studies actually showing a higher rate of pacemaker insertion in, into uh, ath endurance athletes, but certainly some review evidence now um, that, that um, there's a higher prevalence of atrial fibrillation. And th this was a review published in 2013, um, uh, highlighting six different studies and the prevalence of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter and in some cases, these these studies were able to work out the relative risk of atrial fibrillation in um, runners or um, orienteers or cross-country skiers or cyclists um, compared with um, uh, controls. And it, it, you can see here that, that in, in study two, there was a nearly a ninefold higher relative risk in, in the uh, non-elite marathon runners compared with controls, a 5.5-fold higher risk in veteran elite orienteers compared with controls, and a 14-fold higher risk in elite um, cyclists compared with golfers in the fifth study here. Um, and in these veteran cross-country skiers, no, no control comparison, but, but, a, but a prevalence of 16.7%, of, of sorry, 16.7% 16, 16 uh, prevalence in, in that group. Um, so um, th this is an emerging area, really. We, we don't really have good evidence to, rec to uh, recommend a threshold uh, at the moment. It requires further study to, to give precise thresholds for how much you shouldn't, should and should not do for atrial fibrillation. And you can find, um, you know, reports such as this one, a six-time Ultraman winner with a normal heart case report. And in, in this report, you know, this chap's doing extreme amounts of exercise, 25 to 30 hours a week, 25 times higher than the recommended dose for health. And yet um, the conclusion of this article was that there were no major abnormalities detected in electrocardiograms. In fact, after his complete evaluation, his heart was found to be quite normal. Um, um, but, but again, we can see cases, it, it, high profile cases. And this was Michael Carrick um, vowing to play on after for Man United back in 2017. Despite being diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, he subsequently had a cardiac ablation, which um, uh, I believe that was successful for a while. I think he's retired now. Um, so la last um, part of the talk, looking at the mechanisms um, linking exercise with heart um, damage. Um, often in these high profile cases, it's linked to a congenital condition termed hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, an inherited disease of heart muscle, where the, the heart muscle walls, left and right ventricle, are thickened um, to the point where they compromise cardiac function uh, and they can lead to cardiac arrhythmia, arrhythmias, so a, a re irregular beating of the heart. We mentioned atrial fibrillation, which, which is, is not good, but, but it's not as bad as ventricular fibrillation, which, which can cause cardiac arrest and, um, and, and death. Um, and that's the danger with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and about one in 500 people in the UK has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, according to the British Heart Foundation. And, and so if you wanted to visualise that, we've got a normal healthy heart on the left uh, here and, and a, a cardiomyopathy on the right where the heart muscle is enlarged and the walls of the heart are, are thickened. Um, and part of the problem with trying to diagnose this is that exercise does, ha does enlarge the heart, um, both, both the chamber sides and also the, the wall thickness. So, so it sometimes can be difficult to distinguish between a healthy enlarged heart due to exercise and an enlarged heart due to um, a cardiomyopathy. Um, 
And uh, so when we see these these cases of young people dying um, um, uh, with, with the triggering um, by exercise, often that factor is um, or an underlying factor is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, and a, a notable high profile case was the um, ultramarathon runner Mika True, who died in 2012 while he was out on a 12 mile run. And um, and his death was um, subsequently uh, an, an autopsy subsequently put that down to an unclassified cardiomyopathy, but, but likely hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, studies of, of um, uh, high level running, um, in this case, people completing the Boston Marathon, have demonstrated that uh, elevated levels of, of, for example, a protein cardiac troponin, which um, is a protein found in cardiac muscle, shouldn't be in the bloodstream. Um, and if there's damage to the cardiac muscle, it, it might. Uh, leak into the bloodstream, it's a standard biomarker for diagnosing a myocardial infarction. And we see elevated levels in people after a marathon, although it's um, the uh, significance of such elevated levels it, it, it is unclear and it may or may not be, be um, uh, related to permanent heart damage. Um, we do have some animal studies, which, have, um, which are intervention studies, um, exercising animals for periods, uh, in this case, 16 weeks of daily exercise. Um, and the, these have clearly shown that, that, um, that exercise can lead to the accumulation of um, uh, collagen and the fibrosis. So a thickening and scarring of connective tissue, um, usually the result of injury. So in, in this case, and, and, and I appreciate these um, graphs here are quite small possibly for you to be able to, to see but what what this study found was that after 16 weeks of exercise looking at the right ventricular free wall so the outside of the right ventricle the blue bar here in the exercise group showed a, a doubling of, of fibrosis compared with the orange bar in in the sedentary group and that the significance of this fibrosis is that it can it, it can interfere with heart, um, uh, the electrical rhythm of the heart, leading to cardiac arrhythmias um, uh, and potentially um, car uh, atrial or ventricular fibrillation. And l last um, study just to look at here is another, another one confirming in, in an animal model um, with the red bars uh, that in both the right atrium and the left atrium, the, the prevalence of fibrosis after um, 16 weeks of exercise was significantly higher than in the blue bars, the sedentary group. And this study also showed that um, if we look at panel A here, this is the left atrial dimension during diastole, during the resting phase, and um, uh, the left atrial dimension during systole, the contraction phase. And the red line is, is um, exercise, the, the, the blue line is um, uh, sedentary. And, and in the diastole, in the resting phase, there was a significant elevation in the... Um, diameter during diastole in the exercising group. Um, and um, when that was corrected for body mass, so that's the panel B here, um, centimetres per kilo kilogram body mass, um, both during diastole and during systole, the diameter was enlarged um, in the exercising group. Um, and also if we go to the bottom panel in, in panel B, the right atrial dimension was also significantly enlarged. And stretching of, of the left and right atrium is another factor for promoting atrial fibrillation. Um, so sorry, if I do go to my last slide here. Um, uh, oh no, sorry, I forgot again, two, two more slides. So this is just a, a, a recent study this year published in Heart Journal looking at, at a, another factor that, that's created interest recently, and this is coronary artery calcium, another factor related to atherosclerosis. And, and in the interest of time, I won't dwell on this, but what this study was showing that when you classify individuals in inactive, moderately active, or highly active ba based on um, the International Physical Activity short form questionnaire, so it's a limitation, it's just a questionnaire, 
but they did show that both at baseline, so this is the baseline row here, showing a slightly higher prevalence of coronary artery calcium in the active group, and the progression over a five-year period, that progression was increased in those who were more active or highly active compared to inactive. So this study concluded that engaging in physical activity may accelerate the progression of coronary artery calcium. And ostensibly, that's a bad thing, although that they did state in this study that, that in some cases, um, coronary artery calcium accumulation can help to, to stabilize a, a plaque, making it less likely to rupture. So the jury is out as to whether that this is a good or a bad thing. Um, and if I can just finish by citing the um, statement in circulation by Thompson and colleagues, um, that um, habitual activity reduces coronary heart disease risk. Vigorous exercise transiently increases the risk of sudden, sudden death or myocardial infarction. And when that happens in young people, it's due to hereditary or congenital cardiovascular abnormalities usually. When it happens in older people, it's more likely to be linked with atherosclerosis and atherosclerotic disease. And finally, the incidence of both acute MI and sudden death is greatest in the habitually least active individuals performing unaccustomed exercise. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks for that interesting talk there, David. If, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat and we can uh, address them now if, if we have any now. Just to, just to follow up, David, I'll ask you a quick one. Um, do, do you think there'll ever be a, a need or we can ever foresee there being a safe upper limit prescribed for exercise based on these developing findings? Thanks, James. Um, I think it might be quite difficult um, to come up with an, a one-size-fits-all um, guideline because I, I think it might depend on um, how long somebody is doing a high volumes of, of exercise. I think you can, you know, you might be able to get away with it for a year or two or three years, but, but if you carry on doing it for 10 years or 20 years, you know, it might be an accumulation effect. Um, so I think you'd need to factor that in. I think you need to factor things in. I think we're learning a lot about sleep in, in recent years. And it might be that, that the same volume of exercise, given, um, given the right amount of sleep and rest and recuperation, it, it is fine. But, but if you're doing that same amount of exercise, but you're sleep deprived um, or you've got other stresses in life, work and family and so on, that it's not. So I think there's lots of different factors um, uh, um, youth versus middle age might be another factor. So I think we're a long way off from that. Um, but I'm sure we can we can put some guidelines in which have sort of minimums and maximum am amounts and so on. So I'm sure we, we, we can do better than we've got at the moment. But I think we've got a lot to learn. Thanks, David. There's just there's a couple that have come from the chat. The first one being, David, what would you advise for exercise for those with atrial fibrillation? Uh, so very good question. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, I, I can say as somebody who suffered from atrial fibrillation myself, um, uh, not, not currently, but in the, in the past, I had permanent atrial fibrillation for three years um, and uh, I, it didn't stop me exercising at all. It just it severely limited um, the, the the continuity of my exercise you know I, I i soon got out of breath when i tried running for example but i could run and i'd have and i'd often have to stop and pause for a couple of minutes before i carried on but it, it i was never told it was going to trigger a heart attack um but i i didn't have any un, uh, other underlying conditions so again there's no one size fits all because some people with af also have other um underlying conditions that that maybe need to be taken into account um, I think intensity is a key thing. Um, so lower levels of exercise, um, like walking, some people can tolerate that really well and, and don't even know they've got atrial fibrillation when they're walking. It only comes out with more vigorous exercise. For other people, they're quite symptomatic even at low levels. So really, um, you have to be guided by your own symptoms and also what, what, what the doctor will tell 
tell you. Um, uh, but but I would say carry on exercising if you can, but find out what works for you and what doesn't bring on symptoms. Well, thanks, Evan. Very last one. There's a question about um, what can we say about the risk to the heart from vigorous exercise during chemotherapy? I'm not I'm not sure if you'll have a an answer on that one, David. Yeah, I mean that, that's a really really good question, um, and you know, vigorous exercise with other conditions, not just you know, chemotherapy, but, but disparate conditions like ME, and uh, um, there, there's a lot of debate about that. I think NICE changed their guidelines around that recently. I think um, really you've, you know, um, you've got to be guided by your the person, you know, the physician that's looking after you with that and your own uh, symptoms and your own how you feel about that I think there is good evidence coming out that the exercise um, can be beneficial um, in in um, in people certainly after chemotherapy once they're recovering from from um, uh, chemotherapy and, and from uh, uh, cancer surgery and so on and so forth during chemotherapy yeah I, I wouldn't I don't have a great deal of expertise in that. I think probably I'd say um, being guided by your physician as well as how, how you're also feeling and coping with chemotherapy, which can be really debilitating. Um, that, that's probably as much as I could say. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for that, David. There's one more question that's come through, but we'll, we'll have to leave that for now because we need yeah. to move on to Catherine. But well, thanks very yeah, much. Yeah, I'm happy to, for people to email me as well. And I'll do my best. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thanks. So, We'll move on now to our second talk of the evening, of the evening which will be given by uh, Dr. Catherine uh, brook Wavell. Catherine is a senior lecturer in human biology here at our school, and, and Catherine's our re resident expert in everything to do with physical activity uh, and bone health. So I'll, I'll pass over to you now, Catherine. Right, thank you very much, James. Can I just check you can see and hear me and my slides okay? Yeah, that's brilliant. Brilliant, okay. So um, I'm going to focus particularly on the role of exercise in the prevention and management of osteoporosis. I'm going to start off with a summary about osteoporosis. It affects the bones, um, can be associated with bone loss throughout the body, and as well as a low bone mass, there can also be structural changes in the bone. So for instance, the outer cortex, the outer shell of bone, can become much thinner, and in the spongy or trabecular bone more centrally, we might see that there's a loss or thinning of the cross bridges. So this combined with the low bone mass means that the bones become a lot more fragile and a lot more likely to fracture. And this is often the first sign of osteoporosis. It doesn't cause any symptoms until a fracture occurs. It is frighteningly common. It's estimated that in the UK, one out of every two women at the age of 50 will have a fracture in their remaining lifetime. And men aren't immune either with about one in five men. And the consequences are low trauma fractures. The first sign might be a fracture of the forearm, but fractures of the vertebrae have big implications for the quality of life. They can cause pain, disability, etc. And it's hip fractures that are particularly devastating because they take a very long time to heal, uh, during which time people can um, suffer from increased mortality. Um, but also um, reduced physical capacity and reduced independence following a hip fracture. So this can have huge effects on the quality of life as well as huge costs to the NHS. And I heard of, um, I spoke to one lady who um, fell over and um, from being a sort of fit active person in her 50s, she fell over and fractured several vertebrae. And um, she was at that stage told, okay, Keep very still, don't move until you've spoken to a physiotherapist who can tell you what to do or what not to do. So she was frightened to do anything at all, as well as having the pain and the sort of limitations of the vertebral fractures. You know, even put washing in the washing machine. And it was, of course, months before she saw a physiotherapist. So it's really important to know what is it that people should do, firstly, to prevent osteoporosis, but also if they have osteoporosis. If we start off thinking about the risk factors for osteoporotic fracture, some of them we can't change. Um, age it gets more common with age, more common in women, uh, particularly after menopause, and if there's a family history. 
There are also a number of medical conditions associated with increased risk and medications such as glucocorticoid use, for instance. There are some things outside the skeleton that affect the risk of fractures, but they might be able to address. So one thing is the risk of falling because 95% of fractures do result from a fall, although this might be just the sort of trip that we might all have every day, sort of putting your hand out to break a fall, for instance. Um, another factor is low body mass index. And as regards osteoporosis, it's really a very low body mass index as opposed to very high body mass index that's associated with the highest risk. But of course, the properties of the bones themselves make a difference. Firstly, a low bone mineral density. And in a woman, as she ages, uh, with bone loss after menopause and age-related bone loss, uh, women might lose up to a third of their bone mass. And of course, that's going to leave bones weaker. But also the structural changes that I mentioned before might make, an uh, make a difference. So for instance, if we look at the thickness of the outer shell, the outer cortex of bone. And um, this is mapped on these figures. And this compares the thickness of this outer layer of bone in people who had a fracture across the femoral neck, so across here, compared to controls. And we can see there's this patch on the top of the femoral neck, which was substantially and significantly thinner in people who went on to fracture their hips. So it's not just how much bone you have, it's where that bone is as well that can predispose to osteoporotic fracture. So how does that relate to exercise? There's evidence that inactivity is associated with risk of fracture. In a very large study from Sweden, um, they found that people who said they hardly ever walked or cycled had 30% more fractures um, and the, of the hip, 15% more fractures of other sites, the, those that did a few minutes a day and they chose the option that they did less than 20 minutes a day on average. And similarly, people who did any exercise had lower fracture rates than people who said they hardly ever exercised. And also there are studies showing that people, for instance, who are confined to bed, who go up into space, will lose bone fairly, fairly rapidly on unloading. How about people who take exercise? Um, I'm showing a couple of UK studies here. One study, it's a prospective study, uh, looked at how active people are and then followed up how many fractures people had and found that people who said they did strenuous exercise had up to 30% lower risk of fracture, particularly at the hip, although there were less effects at some other sites. And other studies as well have, have, um, internationally have suggested some of them up to sort of 40, 50% lower risk of fracture in people who regularly exercise than people who don't. Having said that, it's not a one way street. Uh, some types of activities can increase the risk of fracture. So another UK study, for instance, found that people who regularly cycled had a somewhat increased fracture risk. And of course, that's understandable because it's probably not cycling, it's the coming off the cycle that increases our fracture risk. So, of course, exercise might increase our exposure to hazardous situations or environments. But of course, there are limitations to these studies. The people who exercised are probably different from controls in lots of other ways apart from exercise. They're more likely to be healthy, have a healthy diet, etc. Also, the measurements of exercise in these really large studies are often quite subjective and might be just based on a questionnaire asking, for instance, do you do more or less than 20 minutes of exercise a day or a week or whatever? And they might not assess all parameters, for instance, of how intensely you're exercising. Also, they tend to only be able to group exercise into very crude subgroupings of different exercise. And they might not be physiologically relevant. So if you're looking at aerobic exercise, for instance, how much oxygen is traveling around in your bloodstream is probably not particularly relevant to the bones. So it's important to measure the most relevant types of exercise. And so from these studies, it might be hard to actually make conclusions about what are the best types of exercise to prevent osteoporosis. So 
So go on and think about how is it that exercise could um, reduce or could affect the risk of osteoporosis. And of course, one way could be through increasing bone strength or changing the structure of bone. Another way is that exercise could change the risk of falls. And that might be in two directions. It could be that exercise increases strength and balance. But conversely, it could be that exercise exposes you to increased hazards. And there's a final route that um, it seems that having marked kyphosis, curvature of the spine, is associated with increased risk of vertebral fracture. It puts more loading on the front of the vertebrae. Exercise to benefit posture could thus have benefits in terms of vertebral fracture. But if we're going to recommend exercise, we need to know what type of exercise to take. And um, you can imagine that if you went to your doctor and they said, take medicine, you might have a few questions about what type, what dose, how long for, and the same applies for exercise. What exercise is going to be effective and not all exercise might work. So for instance, we might start off thinking that if we followed the chief medical officer's guidelines for exercise, is that going to increase our bone strength? And so, um, as we all know, we should be doing 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week or 75 of vigorous. Plus, we should be doing strengthening exercises on at least two days a week. And if we're older, we should be improving balance as well as minimizing our sedentary time. So if we're doing all of that, shouldn't we be strengthening our bones? We did a study where we looked at changes in bone density in a group of over 300 older men and women who were recruited through, through primary care, randomised by practice, to talk to exercise interventions or usual care. And these exercise interventions, although they're designed to prevent falls, also met the requirements of the Chief Medical Officer's guidelines in that they included over 150 minutes a week of exercise, including walking and strength and balance training conducted, you can see the participants here did over a week of either sort of home or group-based strength and balance training. And what we found is that the um, incidence of falls was reduced in one of those exercise groups. But there's absolutely no changes in BMD from doing this exercise intervention for six months, even if we looked only at those people that had really adhered well to this intervention. We couldn't say, detect any change whatsoever in the bone density. So it seems that not all exercise works. You can be meeting the national guidelines for exercise, but not benefiting your bone density. So to think about what is it that does work? One thing that we could do is look at some animal studies. And I've put a lovely picture of a turkey on here because a lot of these studies were done in turkeys. And one thing they found that the effects are local. So if you exercise your wings, it's your, the bones in your wings that get stronger. Um, whereas if you exercise your legs, that doesn't benefit the wing bones. Also, they found that with larger forces on bone, they got a greater bone response. And this was the major thing affecting how much increase in bone mass they got, if they put larger forces onto the bones. And also if they applied those forces more rapidly. When it came to the duration of exercise, that didn't seem to matter so much. So just um, squeezing the bones four times a day was enough to prevent the loss that they had when they were mobilized and squeezing the bones 36 times a day produced as much improvement as doing it 50 times as much, 18, 000, 1,800 cycles a day. So effectively, this translates to humans. This means that you don't need to be doing 1,800 steps a day with each leg. Um, it's only the sort of 36 or the first 36 that are going to be having the effect. And also they found that little and often was best and the bone response tends to saturate after a few uh, after a few loading cycles and with the rest pause then the bone starts to become responsive again. So this idea has been developed by um, 
crossed into what's known as the Mekanstadt theory. And this suggests that when we load our bones, so for instance, if we go for a walk, as we apply forces, the stress of our weight acting on our bones, on the bones of our leg, for instance, is going to produce strain in bones. It produces a very small deformation of the bone under the weight of the body. If instead of going for a walk, we go for a run, we're putting greater stresses on bones, that's going to generate greater strains in those bones. And this strain is detected by the bone cells, osteocytes, which stimulate adaptation. So that the bone will adapt to those higher strains, the higher strains by becoming thicker and stronger. So you can see in this schematic, I've shown the bone is becoming a little bit wider, which means that it's now able to cope with these increased stresses if they're regularly imposed, so that the strains are back to the levels uh, that the bones are adapted to. So if we look at the change in bone that we'd expect, depending on the strains that are present in bone, if we have little or no strain in bone, as sort of when we're lying in bed, go up in space, then we see fairly rapid bone loss. When we've got the sort of normal range of strains in bone, then the bone mass tends to stay about the same. If we slightly increase the strains present in the bone, then we start to see an increase in the bone mass. But if we substantially increase the strains in bone, then we see slightly more disorganized bone formation and we could get fatigue, damage or even fracture. So according to this principle, if we want to strengthen bones, what we really want to do is gradually increase the amount of loading that we're putting on the bone. So we're in this moderate overload zone until the bones become stronger to resist those strains and, we'll, and then that will become our normal activity zone. Then once we're adapted, then to slightly increase again, the forces acting on bones. So we're getting a gradual but progressively greater forces acting on bone. So does this work in humans? Uh, uh, there have been a number of trials looking at effects on bone mineral density. And there haven't yet though been any randomized controlled trials of exercise with fracture as a primary outcome. Unlike for pharmaceutical treatments and there for a lot of the major medications that are used to treat osteoporosis, there are studies with sort of tens of thousands of participants that can demonstrate the medications can produce fracture. But unfortunately, we don't have the studies that have been that size looking at exercise, and there, have, uh, there hasn't been the funding to resource such a study. So instead, we've looked at proxy markers such as the bone density. And these meta-analysis have found that exercise can have some fairly modest effects on the bone density. Um, some types of exercise seem to be more effective. So particularly high load, progressive resistance training. So resistance training is resistance lifting a weight. And high load would start off gradually, but be progressive, would be increasing over time as people become stronger. So that people might be lifting a weight that's fairly heavily, about 80% of the greatest weight they could lift, one repetition maximum. Alternatively, a combination of this resistance training with impact exercise, things like aerobics or jumping. But even these types of exercise only produced effects on bone density of about a couple of percent. That's nowhere near the sort of 30, 40 percent reduction in fracture that we see. And it could be that um, that's partly down to other effects of exercise. This study from, the, from Australia looked at the effects of a high load resistance and impact exercise intervention, and they saw fairly small changes in bone density, but much greater improvements in structural estimates of bone strength. So there seemed to be redistribution of the bone as well. Similarly, we did a study where we had people doing a couple of minutes a day, hopping on one leg, and we found that there was an increase in the bone mineral in the exercise leg relative to the control leg of about a couple of percent. 
but looking at the distribution of bone, we found that there were substantially bigger increases in some regions in the excise leg, including at this area we saw earlier on where thinning of the bone could be disposed to osteoporotic fracture. And what about if we continue this for longer? Um, look at bone density changes in one study that followed up participants over 16 years. We can see that the biggest benefits were seen initially and that over the time, the people in the exercise group did lose bone with age. These were postmenopausal women. But the people who didn't exercise lost bone even more rapidly. And another study from Finland uh, compared people doing resistance exercise, balance and jumping exercise, or a combination of those. And after they'd done this exercise for 12 months, and after they'd stopped that, they followed up their medical records over the next five years. And this graph shows what happened to their risk of having a fall or an injurious fall over the next five years. And you can see that um, by the end of the five years, only about half or less than half the control group had survived without an injurious fall whereas substantially fewer of the people that done the combined exercise had had a fall. And the people that done that combination of resistance, balance and jumping exercise also had 74% fewer fractures. So we're seeing a benefit there presumably from combination of improving bone strength and from reducing falls. So what can we do to prevent falls? There have been a huge number of studies that have looked at the effect of exercise on falls and there's really strong evidence now that exercise can have benefits on the rate of falls and the rate of fractures. Look at different types of exercise balance. Exercise alone can reduce fall rate, but you get greater reductions still combining balance with some other functional exercises, lower limb strengthening exercises, getting out of a chair, etc. In terms of what types of exercise are effective. Ideally, it needs a progressive challenge to balance. So you can do this by gradually reducing the base of support and reducing support. So start on holding onto a firm support in people with poor balance and with the feet further apart so you've got a stable base, then move the feet so they're closer together or standing on one leg and then moving the center of gravity to challenge balance. Also doing strength training. So for instance, using uh, weights to um, strengthen the bones in the lower limb, particularly the lower leg. And the programs are most effective if they did include this pre progressive challenge to balance and that increased over time. And if they included over three hours a week of exercise or over 40 hours total, which is a problem for the falls prevention exercise programs in the UK, which might often only be about six weeks long, so it would be hard to provide for 40 hours. The final way in which exercise can be beneficial is benefiting kyphosis, which is associated with poorer physical function, increased risk of falls, fractures and mortality. And there have been several trials looking at the exercise on the effects of exercise on kyphosis. And the strategies used have often been um, strengthening exercises, particularly exercises of the spinal extensor muscles and also so strength stretching exercises and systematic review found that there were improvements in kyphosis and particularly from strengthening exercises. So what should happen though in people who have osteoporosis or vertebral fracture? And some Cochrane reviews have studied this and found that there are variable levels of evidence. So whilst there's substantial evidence that exercise can prevent falls, in people with osteoporosis and a bit less in people with vertebral fracture. Although some studies reported benefits in pain, muscle strength, et cetera, and physical function, there was a, a very low standard evidence and a fairly low number of studies that have looked at this. Another concern is that people with osteoporosis or vertebral fracture, there could be adverse events during exercise. But the Royal Osteoporosis Society recently convened a group of experts to um, have a consensus statement looking at exercise and osteoporosis. 
as part of which did a systematic review on the adverse events during exercise. And as part of that scouring all the literature, they found just a couple of case studies reporting vertebral fracture, particularly with marked curvature of the spine, for instance, doing sit-ups or extreme yoga positions. Um, and in all the randomized controlled trials of exercise and interventions, they didn't see any vertebral fractures associated with impact exercise or muscle strengthening exercise. Although it's important to remember that these interventions normally started gently and gradually progressed as people are able to do them safely. And most of them have been supervised. But in fact, they saw that the rate of fractures in the exercise group were lower than those in the control groups. So the biggest risk of fracture is from not exercising. And so um, based on the evidence to date and also on expert consensus where um, their evidence was missing, the Royal Osteoporosis Society put together a consensus statement on exercise and osteoporosis. And so what they recommend is that to build bone strength, people should do either weight bearing impact exercise with sort of building up from lower to more moderate impacts with about just 50 impacts a session. So that might be only a couple of minutes a day um, and or do resistance exercise, building up gently to doing maybe sort of uh, lifting a weight that can only be lifted about eight times before needing to take a break. So doing a fairly low number of reps, but with a heavier weight once that can be done safely. And um, although there's a proviso that in people with vertebral fractures, some lower impact might be advisable and individual, like individualized advice. But some studies in Australia have used a high load, um, high um, impact exercise, carefully supervised in people, women with osteoporosis, and have seen very few adverse effects from that and substantial benefits in bone density. Also suggested that there should be exercises to improve balance and exercises to improve posture, but also care during lifting, trying to bend at the hips, for instance, rather than bending forward at the spine. So in summary, the recommendations for exercise for osteoporosis prevention are that um, there's evidence that exercises have fewer fractures, although whether some of the compounding factors explain that isn't yet clear. We got strong evidence that exercise increases BMD, although those are relatively modest, but there could be some structural changes that have further benefits on strength. And that high load resistance training and impact exercise are most effective. And it's better to try and carefully introduce and build up to higher loads rather than try and do high volumes of exercise. And also strength and balance training <laughs> programs are important to reduce floor risk. As regards exercise management, the recommendations are that people at risk of falls should do falls prevention exercise. And in those with low bone mineral density, um, ideally gradually maintain or increase resistance exercise to strengthen bone. And those with vertebral fractures, spine extensor exercise and modify movements, but particularly to enable movement, to encourage people to carry on moving because not exercising is going to reduce the strength of the spinal muscles, is going to cause further bone loss and increase risk of falls. I've put the link here to the Royal Osteoporosis Society um, webpage, and there's lots of resources there and videos, etc., for anyone interested. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for that, Catherine. Really interesting talk there. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat, Catherine. I don't know if you can see those. Um, first one says, what does the research suggest for the management of osteoporosis diagnosed in the premenopausal population due to, is it reduced energy deficit in sport possibly? Red, red S. Uh, medications are contraindicated due to wanting to have children, but can exercise alone return bone density back all the way from an osteoporosis diagnosis? Yeah, um, yeah, so exercise alone probably couldn't get someone from being sort of um, having a T score of minus two, minus one, 
up to normal. Um, but the key thing, the most important thing is resumption of menstruation, uh, treating the reds. So for instance, increasing energy intake and or reducing training volume. And perhaps instead of the distance, focus on introducing some resistance training to build bone strength and more variety of exercise. Fab, and then there was one about, can you see the one about DEXA there, Catherine? Yeah. Um, so um, her, would healthy bone, bone density for shorter individuals be yeah. lower? I mean, overdox are diagnosed osteoporosis. Um, shorter individuals wouldn't be a problem. Um, potentially, because DEX is 2D, people who are smaller might have less deep bones, but also people who are lower body mass seem to be higher risk of osteoporosis anyway. So um, I don't think there's particularly any problems for shorter individuals, and if anything, there seems to be slightly increased risk of hip fracture for in individuals, for instance, in taller people, which might be due to the shape of the bones. Um, I'll put a link to the consensus statement in the chat. It's free to, uh, to the website. It's free to download. I think you just have to register because they want to keep that, uh, an idea of how many um, copies are available. Okay. And then one final one there, Catherine. The, which strength training is more effective, low velocity or high velocity in postmenopausal women? Um, that's a great question. We're about to do a research study on that, and we're going to be looking for participants in the really low near future. Um, at the moment, there's limited evidence on velocity. As I said, there's some animal studies that suggest that high strain rates seem to be more beneficial. Um, but yeah, um, there's one study that's looked at what we call power training, it suggests that could be more effective than strength training, but it's fairly small. But there's limited evidence on that at the moment. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, lost my screen. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there for, for tonight. Um, obviously, we've got a few more talks to come, but thank you very much, Catherine, for a really fascinating talk. And if any other questions come through, we can send them through on the, on the email. Without further ado, we'll pass on to Vari Morris, or, or Dr. Vari Morris, who's a senior lecturer in biochemistry uh, within our school at Loughborough. And Vari is going to talk to us about uh, physical uh, activity in cancer. So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Vari. Thank you very much, James. I'm just going to share my screen. And then if you could tell me that you can see it or not, that would be great. So can you now see? Yeah, just need to go into slides. Yeah, no, I, I was doing it. It was just a bit delayed. There we go. Thanks a lot. All right. OK, so um, thank you very much, James and Alison as well for organising tonight and inviting me to uh, speak to you tonight. So I, my name is Vary and I'm a cancer biologist and I like to play with cells in the lab. But since moving to Loughborough, I've gotten a, more of an interest in the role that exercise can play in preventing cancer. And in particular, I'm really interested in what it can do for metastatic cancer. Um, so what I want to cover tonight or what we're going to just discover in the next half hour or so is how our immune system actually protects us against cancer in the first place, um, how it can help prevent cancer from arising, the importance of exercise, not just in prevention, but also throughout the whole cancer continuum, uh, what happens to existing cancers when we exercise, and also the impact that exercise has on immune function, and particularly what this does in patients and then I'm going to cover off the current recommendations for exercise which actually are largely the same in patients as they are in the general population. Okay so let's start off with our immune system and how it protects us against cancer. So I'm not going to um, go into too much detail so I'm sure you're all very familiar with cancer but typically it's been known as a disease that's caused by mutations genetic mutations in genes that give rise to these cells that just grow prolifically and they, they ignore all the normal signals to die off when they should and this gives rise to cancer but there was a really interesting study that came out of the University of Dundee um, about three or four years ago um, where they plotted they took something like two million different cancer cases across the world and they plotted declining immune function with age against rising cancer incidence and they actually saw a closer correlation between these two parameters than we do with the, the classic genetic to hit hypothesis so um you're in your a chest about the size of your fist you'll have an organ called your thymus and that is what gives rise to our t-cells 
um, which are important for, as we'll see soon, these are important for regulating cancer or for eliminating rogue cancer cells. Um, and that thymus actually shrinks on average by half every 16 years from the age of two right up to um, the, the day you die. It shrinks by half in its size and therefore you produce fewer and fewer T cells. Now that declining um, immune function that shrinkage actually occurs slightly more fast uh, faster in men than it does in women and this slightly accounts for the difference in longevity between the slight difference in longevity between men and women so this group here from Dundee showed that um, as you get older that declining immune function plots really closely along with rising cancer incidence so there are two main, well, three main type, cell types that are involved in protecting against cancer. And the first are part of our non-specific immune response. And these are called natural killer cells or NK cells. So they don't, they're not fussy. They don't de uh, determine, um, they don't have to recognize particular things on particular cells like our T cells and B cells do. Um, and I liken them to being a bit like Daleks that are roaming around your system looking for signs of trouble. So NK cells will pick up virus infected cells, but they'll also pick up any rogue cancer cells. And they do so because of the diff different um, signaling molecules that they have on their surface. So they have the balance between inhibitory receptors and activatory receptors. And it depends which ones are engaged, which Will dictate whether the NK cell is going to kill it, its target or not. So if on a normal healthy cell, if you look on the left hand side here of this image, on a normal healthy cell, we have these molecules called, <clears throat> excuse me, MHC class one molecules, which are part of your, your blood immune system. Um, and these will engage the inhibitory receptors. So if an NK cell comes along and meets a normal healthy cell in the body, it will engage with these MHC class one molecules and it knows not to kill that target cell. However, tumor cells don't or they downregulate the expression of these MHC class one cells. And instead, the balance is swung in favor of these activatory receptors. So instead, the NK cell shakes hands with the tumor cell and finds all these activatory receptors. And so it receives a signal that says these are no good. We have to get rid of them and it kills them off. And it does so in, in two ways ways. The first is directly by its cytolytic activity. So it, these NK cells will secrete granzymes, these little molecules that will punch holes in the surface of these tumor cells, causing them to essentially burst. And then second, they also at the same time will be secreting other cytokines, which will be essentially um, giving a signal to other immune cells in the body to come along and, and help kill off these cancer cells. And these other immune cells that are involved are our T cells that we already mentioned that are formed in our thymus and also B cells as well, which produce antibodies. So um, if you have a tumour in the body and it will express particular antigens that are only expressed on these tumour cells, we call these tumour antigens, these will be picked up by a particular class of cell called an antigen presenting cell, which, as the name suggests, presents antigen on its surface so it can be recognized by naive T cells and also allows it to the body to create antibodies that are specific to these antigens by our B cells. So these are the, the three main cell types that are involved in protecting us against cancer. they are NK cells, your natural killer cells, the Daleks, and then these cytotoxic T cells and B cells, which are much more specific. So they will recognize just specific antigens to mount in a response. And the end result is the same. It eliminates the cancer cells. But clearly it's not a perfect system. Otherwise we wouldn't have uh, cancer being so prevalent in, in the body. So let, moving on to exercise and how it can help. So the evidence so far is that we know that leisure time physical activity, so this is not necessarily running a marathon, this could be doing some gardening and um, cycling to work, these things. Leisure time physical activity can reduce the risk of some cancers. I think it's up to 13 it's different cancers, including esophageal adenocarcinoma, liver cancer, lung cancer, cancers of the kidney, gastric cardia, and endometrial cancer in women, myeloid leukemia and myeloma, which are both types of blood cancers, colon cancer, head and neck cancer, uh, rectal and bladder and breast cancer in, in women and men, actually. Um, but there are other cancers that have been identified since. So prostate cancer doesn't feature on this list, but we know that exercise can prevent prostate cancer as well. Um, but we're, we're learning more and more each day. But the point is that exercise is really good at reducing the risk of these cancers. But how does it do it? Well, there's there's lots of different mechanisms, but there's four that we're particularly interested in. The first is by reducing the number of sex hormones that are flooding the body. So um, 
particularly in, if you imagine, in obese or slightly overweight individuals, in women particularly, um, adipose tissue or fat cells are actually a rich source of estrogen. And so people who have um, excess adipose tissue in their body will have excess levels of estrogen circulating around in their blood. Exercise actually serves to reduce the numbers of these sex hormones and estrogen itself is a growth hormone which drives the growth of cancer cells. So by exercising and reducing those um, hormones, this actually helps to slow the growth of cancer cells. In a similar manner, exercise can also reduce the amount of insulin and insulin-like growth factor one, which are circulating around the body, which again promote the growth of, of cancers. But I'm particularly interested in these uh, sec- numbers three and four here. Exercise reduces overall chronic inflammation. So in people, particularly, again, going back to obese and overweight population, have significantly higher levels of low-grade chronic inflammation. And by just embarking on only six weeks of exercise, you can massively reduce the levels of chronic inflammation and partly because of the reduction in adiposity as well, uh, which um, prevents cancer or stops or slows the growth of cancer and then also immune function so exercise can if you if you undertake moderate intensity exercise this increases the number of your t-cells and the number of nk cells and other immune cells like neutrophils in the bloodstream which as i've just demonstrated before are important for eliminating rogue cancer cells So we know that exercise can prevent cancer in the first place, but what about undertaking exercise during treatments and potentially protecting against secondary cancers? Well, let's take this imaginary person here who was born, let's say, and maybe in his his 30s or 40s gets diagnosed with cancer. Uh, He'll then undergo chemotherapy. And after several rounds of that, if he comes out the other end, no evidence of disease. After five years, he'll fall into what we call the survivorship pool. Um, And then maybe if he's very unlucky, some years later could have a secondary recurrence and sadly will die. And it could be from the secondary cancer that kills him or it could be something else. If this patient exercises regularly throughout his life, um, he actually reduces his primary risk, as we've just mentioned. But also if he then even still then goes on to get cancer, he actually improves his response to chemotherapy. So there's evidence to show that people who undertake exercise before and during chemotherapy are fit for surgery for a start, but they're also, they have an improved chemo responsiveness. There is some evidence that it actually protects the healthy tissues preferentially um, and um, allows the the, um, cancer cells to be more responsive to chemotherapy. It improves their recovery as well. So they'll they'll recover from surgery as well as chemotherapy more quickly. Um, and there is some evidence, but it's a little sketchy as to the ability to reduce secondary cancer risk. And partly this is because of the length of time that it can take for a secondary cancer to arise. And the studies typically aren't, you know, if you apply for a grant application, for example, these grants often fund research for three to five years, whereas we really would be needing research to be funded for like 10, 20 years to be able to truly assess whether um, exercise can reduce secondary cancer risk. Uh, But this is something that we're trying to do in the lab at the moment by kind of mimicking cancer in a cellular environment in the lab uh, to see if we can reduce the metastatic capacity of cancer cells in response to exercise. Um, There's also lots and lots more mounting evidence. In fact, I had a very, very talented undergraduate student this year who were publishing his work actually in the Nature Scientific Reports. This is a snippet from that. Um, He undertook a meta-analysis and systematic review looking at the effects of combined resistance and endurance exercise interventions and the improvement, or if there was an improvement in a whole host of different parameters. So he looked at global fatigue, depression, um, muscle strength, um, muscular, um, cardiovascular fitness, and, and a number of other things as well. And what we found is that we got a significant long-lasting improvement in global fatigue in breast cancer patients and also many improvements that weren't necessarily significant in the remaining side effects. So, for example, um, individually resistance exercise on its own or endurance exercise on its own also improved these side effects, but there wasn't a significant level. Um, Interestingly, what he found was that resistance interventions overall had a a more or more beneficial to, to breast cancer patients. So what happens to existing cancers when we exercise? So if you were to take cells in the lab and culture them with um, 
exercise serum, or indeed in this, uh, this study here that was published in 2016, um, taking mice that were given access to a voluntary running wheel, and then they were inoculated with cancer. So we have two groups of mice, half of them were um, given access to this running wheel. It was voluntary, but behaviorally, that's what mice do. So, <clears throat> excuse me, they tended to get on the wheel and run. And the other half of the mice were not given access to this uh, running wheel. And then both mice were then inoculated with a, a human tumor and then allowed that we, we, we didn't, somebody else did, looked at the growth of these tumors in these mice. And you can see by eye quite, quite clearly here, the control group that didn't have access to the running wheel, they've got far more tumors growing than the group that had access to the running wheel that exercised and actually reduced cancer cell growth by 67%. However, sadly, this doesn't reduce the size of existing tumors in mice. So if you were to take these mice, inoculate them with cancer first and then give them access to the running wheel, it didn't reduce the size of the existing tumor. And the same is in the case for humans as well, because I mean, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? If we could just literally outrun the cancers, but we can't. Um, you can take cancer cells incubated with exercise serum and then put them into what we call a nude mouse. So this is a mouse that has no immune system and so therefore it doesn't fight off the cancers. And so if you take these cancer cells inoculated with normal serum, you get more tumours than if you were to take them treated with the exercise serum. You get far fewer tumours growing in these mice. So we know that there's something in the blood that is released by exercising muscles, for example, that is causing tumor cells to grow more slowly but we don't know exactly what that is um, and I mentioned earlier that patients who undergo exercise during chemotherapy have uh, improved chemo responsiveness and this is likely due to the increase in vasculature um, so if you look at this image here on the left hand side this is what uh, a diagram of what your healthy vasculature should look like and this here in the bottom the circle is a cross section of the the blood vessel and so you can see a nice neat regular round shape and the endothelial cells that line the blood vessel are nice and closely juxtaposed together they've got a nice pair um, basement membrane surrounding that to make them almost watertight and then they've got these smooth muscle cells on the, along the outside and the smooth muscle cells of course cause the blood vessels to pump however in tumors if you imagine, um, in fact, I've got an example here. I have these little 3D printed tumours um, that I, that was part of a project I was doing at, De at De Montfort University prior. But if you imagine a tumour mass, they, in the cells and right in the middle of that mass, they won't have access to blood vessels. They won't have access to <clears throat> oxygen and nutrients from the blood. And so what they do, they can survive for a little while without that. Um, but after a while, they're going to die off. So what tumor cells do is they grow their own vasculature. This process is called angiogenesis, but they do it in a really hasty manner. So um, my mom used to always say to me, less haste, more speed. And it's the same with tumors. They get really, they just want to make these blood vessels as quickly as they can, but they do it in a really hasty way. And therefore what they produce are leaky and inefficient. Um, so you can see that the endothelial cells, they're not even touching. They don't have the nice uh, smooth muscle cell wall around the outside. And so these are very leaky, which means if you were to give this patient chemotherapy, the chemotherapy that would reach here around the outside of the tumor would reach it, it's fine, but it wouldn't get right into the center of the tumor because of these leaky blood vessels. Whereas when you ask a patient to exercise, they're going to produce healthier vasculature within that tumor which allows that chemotherapy to get right into the center of the tumor and makes it much more effective. There's also some evidence to suggest that <clears throat> excuse me, patients who undergo exercise through, throughout chemotherapy can endure higher doses of chemotherapy without the, the um, negative side effects quite so much. So I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk about immune function and I'm particularly interested in what the immune cells uh, do against cancer. So we know that in patients who, um, sorry, in patients who have cancer, those who have more NK cells or cytotoxic T cells typically have a better prognosis, um, as you would imagine, because they've got more of these cells there to eliminate any rogue cancer cells. And we also know that exercise can mobilize these NK cells and cytotoxic T cells. So th th this is why we know that exercise can improve immune function in patients. So these NK cells, these Daleks, are very sensitive to exercise. 
they're one of the first immune cells types to be mobilized following an acute bout of exercise. So when you exercise, you typically reduce, uh, release adrenaline or noradrenaline, and your NK cells actually express more of the receptors for these, uh, these catecholamines, that's adrenaline and noradrenaline. They're called beta-adrenergic receptors. So they express more of these than any other immune cell type. And because of this release, it binds to the receptor, which causes these cells to be mobilized and then we come to the, the site where they need to be to eliminate these cancer cells. Cancer patients who participated in moderate intensity exercise showed an increase not only in the number of NK cells, but also their cytotoxic activity, i.e. the killer cells were more killy. And they had an increase in the proliferation or growth of their lymphocytes, so they've got more T cells there to help kill off cancer cells and more B cells there to make antibodies to um, tag other ones. But what was interesting is that when you look at this in um, a whole host of different patients, exercise appears to be more beneficial for the patients who have got a compromised immune function to begin with. And I suppose if you think about this from an arbitrary scale, if you were to say great immune functions, like perfect immune functions are 10 out of 10 and immunocompromising patients who are immunocompromised or maybe sitting at a three or a four, those who exercise, if you're already sitting at seven or eight and you exercise, that increase is not going to be as beneficial to you as if you are sitting at a three or a four, if that makes sense. Now, there's a really, really excellent resource that I would recommend all of you to look at for any conversations that you're having with patients or clients who have cancer. Um, this was uh, funded by the uh, Faculty of Sport Exercise Medicine and it's movingmedicine.ac.uk. So I'll put a link to that in the chat afterwards as well. Um, and they have a whole bank of resources that are really public friendly. So you can download infographics and informational leaflets that you can hand over to your patients. And they also have what's really handy on their website is they have a set of guides. So if you have only one minute to chat to your patient about this, here's some questions to ask them. If you have three minutes and if you have five minutes or more. So you can you can tailor it to your needs uh, based on your the time allowance that you have with your patients. Um, so the current recommendations, this is according to the American College of Sports Medicine, the ACSM, uh, and they publish guidelines every few years. The latest ones were published in 2019. And it's the same for the general population as it is for patients. So the recommendations is to undertake 15, sorry, 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So that is five 30 to 60 minute bouts or 75 to 150 minutes per week of vigorous intensity exercise. So that's about five times 15 to 30 minutes. Now there was a question in the chat earlier on uh, following Professor David Stencil's talk uh, asking about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the recommendations for vigorous intensity exercise for patients undergoing chemotherapy. Um, I don't know specifically that there are any recommendations. However, I do think it would be challenging, uh, depending on the health and fitness status of the patient themselves, but um, patients often under experience not only cancer-related fatigue, but chemotherapy-related fatigue. Um, so vigorous intensity exercise is going to feel a lot harder and therefore not maybe be as easy to, to do. Um, what I say is to, to go on the basis of how they feel. You, you know your own body better than anyone can ever tell you what you can do. Um, so it's not that it's not safe, but just to be aware of what your what your body can cope with. So they have uh, also, also on this website, this is the American College of Sports Medicine website. They also have an infographic which outlines the evidence for um, aerobic exercise and resistance exercise and a combination of the two for reducing cancer-related fatigue, um, improving health related quality of life and improving physical functioning as well. Um, there's some evidence for strong evidence for aerobic exercise in reducing anxiety and depression. And there's strong evidence for resistance exercise, reducing lymphedema, which is particularly prevalent in uh, breast cancer survivors following surgery. Um, so certain things are going to affect an individual's ability to exercise. So the type and stage of cancer that they have, how, how aggressive it is and how far along it is, the type of cancer treatment they're undergoing. Um, so are they just, I say just, I don't mean just in a uh, sort of minimising way, but is it chemotherapy on its own? Is it chemotherapy and radiotherapy? Is it hormone therapy? All these treatments are going to have different impacts on the patients um, and this will impact on their stamina, their endurance and their, their baseline strength and fitness level. So a patient who has already got a really strong level of fitness 
will probably be able to undertake more exercise than somebody who's maybe not been active they're very sedentary um, but the the general advice is to sit less and move more and and listen to your own body do what you can start off slow and build it up slowly so exercise can prevent tumors from growing in the first place but sadly can't shrink the size of existing tumors uh, it's most beneficial to p- patients who are already immunocompromised um, the moving medicine resource is a brilliant conversation starter for GPs and allied health professionals, anyone who's working directly with patients. And the current recommendations for exercise in cancer patients is the same as it is for the general population. That's five times 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise each week. Um, And the outline recommendations for returning to exercise are to phase in gradual increases to your bouts of exercise whilst listening to your body, of course. Thank you very, very much. Um, Again, I'm going to ask if you have any questions. Um, that's me. Brilliant. Thanks very much for that talk, uh, Vari. So please do do use the chat. Um, yes, so we do have somebody wanting to unmute themselves. So please go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I was just wondering, uh, the, the vasculature part was slightly um, uh, interesting to me. Um, so if... If, if the chemotherapy drug is going to go into the um, tissue, to the center of the tissue upon uh, exercise, is exercise without any chemotherapy actually feeding the cancer cell to or the tissue to grow further? Well, that's a good question. So this is a, a bit of a catch-22. So I say this when I'm giving lectures to students. You would think it's counterintuitive that having more vasculature in there would be a good thing because you would think that's going to feed the cancer, isn't it? You're going to have more oxygen and nutrients. And I suppose it is, but overall, you're also allowing chemotherapy to get into that central part. Um, so you're, you're going to, if you imagine like radiotherapy, for example, if you're going to hit a tumour with radiotherapy, you're only going to get the bits on the outside, whereas chemotherapy is going to allow you to get to the, the, the cells sitting on the inside. But yeah, no, I know, I know it's, it feels counterintuitive, but there you go. <laughs> Um, so sorry, uh, I, I just have a uh, quick clarification regarding that. So, mm-hmm. if it, so, so if if the purpose of exercise during chemotherapy is to get the drug into it, uh, so when we are not undergoing chemotherapy, um, is you know exercise feeding the tissue, uh, then there is no chemotherapy that is happening. Oh, I I don't know for sure, but we know that exercise mobilizes your immune cells, so you're not necessarily feeding the cells in the center of the tumor i suppose you're going to have less necrosis in the center of the tumor but overall the benefits far outweigh the the risks i think i'm not sure if i answered that yeah thank you i'll I'll just ask one question if i may uh so whenever we talk usually about physical activity we always sort of pair it with diet in the kind of the general lifestyle sense is there any sort of evidence about specific nutrients or dietary oh. strategies, particularly like during if someone has cancer and during chemo? Mm. Is yeah. that researched? Yes. Um, so there's a lot of evidence around intermittent fasting and the fasting mimicking diet. Um, it's a very new emerging area, but there is promising results. So the idea being when you fast, your whole body shuts down every metabolic process, doesn't it? And of course, what does chemotherapy target? rapidly growing and dividing cells so everything in your body shuts down except for the cancer cells because they don't listen to the same signals so you're kind of providing a magic shield if you like over the the healthy tissues and allowing the chemotherapy to target the rapidly growing and dividing cancer cells it is fairly new the difficulty is it's not particularly easy to do when you're fit and healthy let alone when you're going Mm. through chemotherapy and sometimes particularly the psychology of going through treatment not like if you feel like you're depriving yourself of nice food which is probably one of the only things you can enjoy right then um it can be hard to stick to and that's that's the difficulty we're having what we don't know is if there's any synergy between the two if you were to do fasting mimicking as well as exercise whether that would like be a double whammy against the cancer cells maybe um that's something we're trying to do studies on but um yeah (laughs) it's challenging interesting um Last question. I'll ask you one more then. So um, in terms of like research and cutting edge with regards to exercise, are there any sort of topics at the moment that you think are really exciting? That's a hard question. Um, 
something that I've got a student working on at the moment that I think is quite exciting is um, like so we, uh, Catherine talked to this earlier about the different types of exercise so what is uh, what types of exercise are beneficial um, and there is a lot of evidence for yoga and I think they call them mind body therapies so yoga tai chi qigong those kinds of exercises in promoting quality of life in patients but we don't know they really know much about what's happening at the molecular level so I'd say that's probably quite an interesting area at the moment um yeah Brilliant. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, Thank you. But uh, we're we're sort of only a few minutes behind, but we'll we'll move on to the last talk this evening. So, so unfortunately, the last talk tonight is going to be a pre-recorded talk because uh, Dr. Dr. Natalie Pearson has some personal circumstances intervene. Um, Alison, do you have the presentation there to hand? Just one second, and I should bring it up. Hopefully, if anybody has any questions about this talk that we're about to to play. Um, obviously use the chat again and we can put the questions to Natalie uh, and obviously get responses back to you. Well, this, this talk is about movement behaviours in young people um, finding the balance. And it's been given by Dr. Natalie Pearson, who is a senior research fellow, again, in our school at Loughborough with expertise in uh, child health and, and public health. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Natalie Pearson, a senior research associate in physical activity and public health. I'm sorry I can't be there this, e um, this evening in person. So my research interests are in physical activity, sedentary behaviour, sleep and diet in young people, with a focus on understanding the factors that influence these behaviours, the health outcomes of these behaviours and the design of interventions to change these behaviours. What I'm going to talk to you about this evening is movement behaviours in the context of time and how important it is that we consider time when we are looking to positively change movement behaviours. So when I talk about movement behaviours, I'm referring to sleep, sedentary behaviour and physical activity, and these are collectively referred to as movement behaviours. So in the UK, we have physical activity guidelines for young people that recommend that children and young people aged 5 to 18 years take part in an average of 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day across the week. And in the guidelines, there are examples of what physical activities should make up these 60 minutes. The government recommendations for physical activity are underpinned by moderate to strong evidence that children who participate in adequate levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity have better bone health, better cognitive function, better cardiovascular fitness, better muscular fitness, have a better weight status and are less likely to suffer from mental ill health such as depression compared to children who are inactive. And when I say inactive, I mean insufficiently active or not meeting the physical activity guidelines. In the UK, we don't have specific recommendations for the amount of time young people should be sedentary. When I'm talking about sedentary time, I'm talking about the activities that are carried out in a seated or reclined position that require very low energy expenditure. Examples, sitting on public transport, sitting in school and sitting to watch or use screens. So the Chief Medical Officer guidelines suggest that young children and young people should aim to minimise the amount of time spent being sedentary and when physically possible should break up long periods of time spent sitting or not moving with at least light physical activity. In relation to sedentary time, the review of evidence base highlighted there is insufficient evidence at this time to support suggesting a specific time um, for sedentary behaviour like we have with the 60 minutes of physical activity, the evidence just isn't there to put a time on sedentary. So while meeting the physical activity guidelines is associated with positive health outcomes, as I've just mentioned, increased or long periods of time spent sedentary is linked to poor health, such as those pictured, as well as increased levels of obesity, poor diet, loneliness, isolation, and a list of many more poor health conditions. <clears throat> so in the UK, we don't have specific 
guidelines for sleep either. But these are some common suggested amounts that young people should be getting on average. So children 7 to 12 should be getting around 10 to 11 hours a day. So inadequate sleep has been linked to poor mental health outcomes, such as concentration problems, risk of anxiety and risk of depression. Getting adequate levels of sleep have been associated with positive physical health outcomes, um, such as reduced risk of diabetes, reduced risk of obesity, healthier skin, stronger immune system, um, and also allows young people to rest and restore muscle to aid growth. So we know that these behaviours um, from the healthy point of view are good for us and from an unhealthy point of view are bad um, for our young people's health. And COVID-19 has had a profound effect on these individual behaviours. Lockdown was hugely disruptive to children and young people's abilities, opportunities and motivations to be physically active because of the restrictions that were put in place and because of all of the closures. These are some of the factors that have been identified as barriers to young people's physical activity during the lockdown. So, for example, at the intra-individual level, people, young people just not motivated to be physically active. They were suffering from poor mental health, so obviously didn't feel like being active. Um, from an environmental point of view, a less time spent outdoors with increased um, time inside and more time uh, using screens. What lockdown meant for children was not equal across all children. Some children fared better than others because of the environments they live in and the opportunities that they have. Lockdown and post-COVID has brought to even greater light the disparities we see, not only in health, but the health behaviours that underpin poor health. So this data um, is from Sport England's Active Live survey and shows that unsurprisingly, activity levels were, were lower during lockdown. And if you delve into this data, you would see that these prevalences are socially patterned. Girls who are typically less active than boys found new ways to become active and were more active than boys during lockdown. However, disparities by deprivation and ethnicity that are entrenched in society were very evident. Those children from ethnic minority groups were significantly less active than white British children. And similarly, with deprivation, children from the most deprived backgrounds were amongst the least active. But we weren't winning before COVID-19 either. In a pooled analysis of 298 population-based surveys with 1.6 million participants, Guthold and colleagues showed the trends in insufficient physical activity between 2001 and 2016. On average, around 80% of school-aged adolescents were not meeting the recommended levels of physical activity. So that means that around 80% of adolescents were doing less than the average of 60 minutes physical activity per day. In a recent meta-analysis of randomised control trials, Rebecca Love and colleagues found strong evidence that current school-based efforts to, do not increase young people's daily physical activity, and no difference was found across sex and socioeconomic status. <clears throat> and sedentary screen time, um, or spending time on screens and setting behaviours, changed the lives of children and young people way before COVID-19. Sedentary screen time, or the amount of time young people spend sitting on screens, is the most prevalent leisure time activity for children and young people. The impact of sedentary screen time on the lives of young people before COVID was increasing, but this has increased again to alarming rates and public health practitioners now have their work on their hands to find a balance between efforts to control and reduce sedentary screen time and on the same time increase physical activity levels. As I've mentioned, as with physical activity, we weren't winning before lockdown with sedentary behaviour either. 
Van Equis et al. examined longitudinal accelerometer data from five, nearly 6,000 children aged 4 to 17 years from eight studies in five countries and examined tracking of young people's total and prolonged sedentary time. Average total sedentary time ranged from around 246 minutes to 386 minutes a day and increased annually by 21 minutes a day. Young people with high levels of sedentary time are likely to remain among the people with the highest sedentary time as they grow older. Steen Johansen et al. harmonized individual level data by reprocessing hip-worn accelerometer data files from 30 different studies conducted between 1997 and 2014, representing almost 50,000 individuals aged 2 to 18 years from 18 different European countries. And they found that the onset of age-related lowering or levelling off of physical activity and increase in sedentary time seems to become apparent at around six to seven years of age. So at this kind of time, at around six to seven, what we see with the physical activity data is that physical activity starts to de decrease or to drop off or the number of children meeting um, government recommendations start to decrease, or we see a steady increase in sedentary time. <clears throat> and along with physical activity and sedentary behaviour, we weren't doing very well um, with sleep either before COVID, um, and inadequate sleep has been a cause for concern for some time. So why aren't we winning? First of all, there's an overfocus on individual health behaviours. For example, there are thousands of papers aimed to understand the, de the determinants of individual behaviours that don't take into account conflicting or competing behaviours. Furthermore, there are hundreds of interventions focusing on single behaviours, such as trying to increase physical activity without considering conflicting behaviours. Here's an example um, of one here, um, the GoActive study. They observed that a rigorously developed school-based intervention funded by the NIHR that cost around £2,500 um, per school was no more effective than standard school practice at preventing declines in adolescent physical activity. <laughs> Physical activity, sedentary time and sleep coexist. These behaviours do not occur, occur in isolation and my own research has shown that these behaviours coexist in young people. In this paper published in JAMA Paediatrics, we show that almost 10% of adolescents fail to meet guidelines for physical activity, screen time and sleep concurrently. In these two papers, published in BMC Public Health, we show that high screen time and poor diet clustered in young people, young children and in young adolescents. Each individual behaviour has independent effects on health outcomes. But the synergistic effect on health would be greater, so we need to consider behaviours together. There is much research on the health outcomes of individual behaviours, and emerging research suggests that the synergistic effects of combined unhealthy behaviours is greater. For example, Rollo and colleagues examined the associations between 24-hour time use composition of movement behaviours or adherence to 24-hour movement guidelines and multiple health indicators across the lifespan in a recent systematic review of evidence. And in children, there was consistent evidence for adiposity and preliminary evidence for health-related quality of life and cardiorespiratory fitness, and that the composition of movement behaviours, specifically greater MVPA relative to other behaviours, was associated with favourable measures. For both children and youth, there was initial evidence that the composition of 24-hour movement behaviours, specifically greater MVPA, more sleep 
less light physical activity and or less sedentary behaviour relative to other behaviours was associated with favourable indicators of adiposity, aerobic fitness, as well as cardiometabolic, social and emotional health. So the research is beginning to mount on the effect of the combination of behaviours rather than a focus on individual behaviours. So there is now a call to move away from trying to increase or decrease individual health behaviours towards finding a healthy balance between daily behaviours. Let us build back from COVID better, but also equitably better, and help those who need it most, or at least design programmes and services that are equitable and tailored or targeted to young people who need it most, rather than fueling further inequalities by, provide, by providing a one-size-fits-all approach. So in our efforts to build back better, we need to take into consideration the whole day, rather than small chunks of the day. The whole day matters. Canada and Australia are leading the way in this space with their integrated 24-hour movement guidelines, stepping away from the focus of individual behaviours and having separate guidelines. The evidence from Canada and Australia to date suggests that adherence to the 24-hour movement guidelines is poor in the early years and among children and youth. Hence, implementation strategies and dissemination approaches to encourage uptake and, and adoption among stakeholders and the general public need to be encouraged and evaluated. Large-scale interventions and public health promotion efforts to encourage a healthy composition of daily movement behaviours and enhanced compliance with the 24-hour movement guidelines are necessary. This is an example of the 24-hour movement guidelines um, that came out in Canada and these are their sort of promotional um, materials that they use and the 24-hour guidelines essentially encourage young people to sweat more, to step more, to sleep better and to sit less. In Australia they also have 24-hour movement guidelines for children and young people and they give specific guidelines for each of the behaviour. So the premise of these 24-hour movement guidelines is that time is finite. And given that time is finite, it's important that we understand that for young people to allocate extra time to being more physically active, that time must come from another behaviour or other activities within the day, such as sitting time or sleep. If you think about the 24 hour day as a series of time blocks where a young person can only be doing one activity at a time, for example, either sleeping or being physically active or being sedentary, a typical day might look something like this. So sitting time and sleep account for more than 90% of many young people's 24 hour days. So reallocating time from these behaviours, rather than trying to solely increase physical activity, could offer a more feasible approach to finding a healthy balance and instilling long term healthy habits in young people. <clears throat> There's growing evidence in this space um, and this study here by Simone found that replacing 10 minutes of sedentary behaviour with vigorous physical activity was associated with lower triglycerides. Replacing sedentary behaviour with vigorous physical activity was associated with better HDLC and triglycerides in children with healthy weight. Replacing sedentary behaviour with moderate physical activity was associated with better uh, HOMA and HDLC in children who had healthy weight and overweight. In this study, data from over 7,000 youths um, and five studies were analysed. Pooled analyses from cross-sectional studies show that replacing sedentary time with light physical activity showed no significant associations, associations with any adiposity related outcomes, but replacing sedentary time with moderate to vigorous physical activity was associated with total body fat percentage, but not with body mass index or waist circumference. <clears throat> 
In another study looking at compositional analyses of time spent in sleep, sedentary behaviour and physical activity, they estimated that in, um, 18 minutes per day increase in moderate to vigorous physical activity, a 21 minute decrease in light physical activity, an 87 minute decrease in sedentary behaviour or a 67 minute increase in sleep relative to the remaining behaviours was associated with a 1.1 uh, unit decrease in BMIZ scores. So what can we do? When we're talking to our patients and young people, we need to consider competing behaviours that may or may not be less, um, more or less desirable. For example, sitting is way more accessible to everyone and often more immediately satisfying than putting on our shoes to go out in the cold and dark to take a walk. Consider the whole day and what that looks like for specific groups of young people. Include young people and families in decision making about reallocating time. We did um, an intervention called Kids First in Children and Young People where we were looking at um, essentially uncoupling the relationship between sitting for screen time and unhealthy snacking. And we came up with um, what we called an A to Z directory where we provided families with this A to Z directory and they came up with their own alternate behaviours to screen time using almost a dictionary. Um, so they, they, they came up with their own ideas for each letter of the alphabet and when um, it came to um, reallocating time from sedentary behaviour they could then pick something from the A to Z um, directory to do instead of being sedentary. Make movement an easier choice that transcends inequalities. And like everything, movement behaviours requires a healthy balance. So let's reframe our narrative and move away from talking about individual healthy beha health behaviours and think about movement behaviours across the whole day. Let's try to make our whole day matter. So thank you so much for listening and sorry again that I couldn't be there in person. Please do get in touch if you have any questions. I'd be really happy to hear from you by email. Thank you. Well, I want to just finish really by thanking everybody for joining us tonight. This is the last of what a five session series um, on these topics. And I know already that um, Alison and Esther have put together a, a really interesting public lecture series for 2022. So please do watch out for those talks. We've got lots and lots of talks um, linked to various events throughout the year next year. Well, yeah, very finally, I'll thank all of the, four, the, well, the three speakers tonight, Vari, Catherine and, and David for giving their talks. Um, and I hope to see you all um, in 2022.